Hey guys, Chris here, and I'm a Ukrainian Canadian. Today's April 2nd, 2023. And let's get to the news happening in Ukraine, shall we? So this is going to be a very quick video, but I first wanted to discuss the latest assessment from the UK intelligence. And they mentioned that Russia's winter offensive in Donbass has failed. And remember, Putin gave an objective to the Russian army to take Don the Donbass by March 31st. Well, he's going to have to extend that timeline again for the 20th or so time. And also remember back in early January, Surovikin was demoted and Gerasimov was put back into the you know his old position. And he didn't waste any time to launch a new offensive. Uh, and 80 days later, as you can see, Bakhmut still holds, Vukhodar still holds, Marinka still holds, and Avdivka still holds, among all the other cities in Donbass that Ukraine currently controls. So overall, it's been a terrible, terrible offensive for the Russians. They did not get any sort of major victory, and their minor successes have been overshadowed by the amount of dead soldiers they incurred in this offensive. Tens of thousands of casualties, and they squandered their temporary advantage in personnel gained as a result of this fall mobilization they had last year. And so Gerasimov is pushing the limits of how far Russia's political leadership will tolerate failure. Well, newsflash, they're going to have to tolerate failure more and more because they don't have any cars left. Putin cannot, you know, indefinitely shuffle uh, his commanders and his, you know, leaders, hoping that the results are going to be diff different because he also can only put people that he really trusts. That's why he put back Gerasimov and Shoihu because these are the two people um, that he he believes have uh, loyalty, total loyalty to him. And so he can't just put any random commander because as you remember, he also, Sorovikin was demoted because there was also some sort of, um, there was allegations that he they were planning something against Putin with Prigozhin and somebody else. I don't remember who it was, but uh, there was a lot of mistrust between Putin, Sorovikin, Prigozhin, and even more so now. And... <clears throat> He cannot just put any random people um, in that position. So he has to stick with Gerasimov, and Gerasimov has nothing else to propose to Putin. So right now, what Russia is betting on is really just exhausting the Ukrainians as much as possible, hoping that their manpower advantage and still their ammunition and large stockpiles of, of, um, of ammunition and weapons is going to exhaust the Ukrainians eventually. So... I also wanted to take a look at the map and obviously you guys know where I'm going to be heading first. It's Bakhmut and the situation is again super difficult for the Ukrainian forces. Let's take a look. So the last few days what changes did we see? So it's mostly north and south of Bakhmut where the Russians did get some ground. You can see if I go backwards in time um, minimal gains but you can see still the Russians are slowly advancing. And the bulk of the fighting right now is really the city center of Bakhmut. So the Russians, mostly the Wagner units, are in control over the industrial area in the north. And by the way, here, there is a footage that came out today of the Ukrainians striking um, one of the Azom factories uh, with the Tochka U missile. Uh, where most likely there was a grouping of Wagner units. And so the Ukrainians are actively, you know, uh, using artillery to strike the, the, the Wagner units here. But also the Wagner units are pushing through the south. And you can see that, um, you know, there was a natural sort of element that kind of gave a, a defensive advantage for the, to, for the Ukrainian forces, which was the Bakhmutska River. So the Russians crossed it and they're now... In control over a quite large part of the south of Bakhmut. However, the thing is, is that um, I think why Ukraine really bet on continuing defending Bakhmut is because they know they have uh, an advantage in urban warfare. The Russians are absolutely terrible in urban warfare. You've seen Mariupol, where they were trying to take Mariupol for three months, um, and the Ukrainians had you know three to four thousand soldiers. And the Russians had 50,000 soldiers that they put just to take Mariupol. And it took him almost three months to take Mariupol. They were doing horrible. And they still 
are doing horrible in urban warfare, even in Bakhmut. And so I've seen a lot of footage in the last couple of days, especially in the south, where the Wagner units are trying to push block by block during the night, and the Ukrainian snipers are picking them off one by one because they have thermal vision, they have good quality scopes, and the Russians have nothing. They're poorly equipped uh, infantrymen, so they're getting slaughtered here, but they're still advancing because they have so many, so many soldiers uh, available still. However, they are getting exhausted as well. The Wagner units are getting exhausted, and you know the furthest they could go, in my opinion, would probably just take Bakhmut if they will be successful in doing so. And I think what the Ukrainians are trying to do right now is uh, they want to coordinate the defense of Bakhmut with their counteroffensive in May. So they hope that they're going to have enough time defending Bakhmut just in time for them to uh, start repelling the Russians away from the outskirts of Bakhmut and cause them to collapse and start fleeing. Um, so I think that's what the game plan right now. And so let's be optimistic that the Ukrainians are going to be able to hold Bakhmut long enough just in time for uh, the you know, major counteroffensive that is most likely going to happen in early May, mid-May at this point. And also, I believe that the Ukrainians are currently grouping and forming, uh, you know, battalions and things like that in Chasivyar or in the outskirts of Bakhmut to prepare for this counteroffensive. Now, this is not going to be the only front that the Ukrainians are going to uh, open during their counteroffensive. We all know that in Zaporizhia, there's another very important um, front that the Ukrainians want because we know that the prized prized jewel in Zaporizhia is Melitopol. It's a very strategic city. I've mentioned it multiple times, and a lot of other analysts have also confirmed that Melitopol is extremely important. It's at the center of this land bridge that Russia created last year, right? They managed to grab all this territory, and Melitopol was key because it's, it sits at the center between, you know, Crimea and um pretty much eastern Ukraine. So the Russians can push uh, railway lines if they want to. Uh, there's a lot of road connections here as well. So it's a very central city. And it also has an airport, um, although it might not be usable at this point, but it can still you know, give a place d'armes for the Russians uh, to set up, uh, you know, bases. And actually, in Melitopol, recently, I think it was today or yesterday, the Ukrainians struck a military base that was just outside of the airport, which is right around here. So this is the airport, and the Ukrainians hit the train station that is also located north of Melitopol and also military base. So um, the Russians feel the heat here, and they definitely know that the Ukrainians are coming from Melitopol. So of course, this is going to be one of the uh, first phases of the counteroffensive, the Ukraine counteroffensive, is going to be uh, taking Melitopol. Now, which front are they going to open? Where are they going to start striking first? It's yet to be known, but um, I think the other city that the Ukrainians are interested in taking, and I think it would make sense, in my opinion, is Vuhladar. So the Russians have failed in Vuhladar for obvious reasons. They were not prepared, um, unmotivated, poorly prepared soldiers, and the same strategy, just frontal assaults on a city that is super open, that has the high ground, and there's no cover. So the Ukrainians were, you know, had the overwhelming advantage of hitting the Russians. And the Russians were super predictable. They never changed course. They constantly just went head first into Vuhladar. Anyways, so they failed in Vuhladar. The Russians are kind of stalling here, if not 100% stalled. And so I think that this is where the Ukrainians should strike back because here the Russians are the weakest. They've put so many resources, so many tanks were lost in APCs and other you know assets that I think it would make sense for this counteroffensive, Ukraine counteroffensive, to hit them back, right? And I'm sure the Russians will collapse very quickly. And then they could go afterwards to Volnovakha which was uh, taken by the Russians in the first month back last year. And Volnovakha is very important because it's a railway connection between Russia and Crimea, um, if we're looking at the land bridge corridor that the Russians established. So Volnovakha is extremely important. And I think that the Ukrainians would want to take Volnovakha and they would, they would have a quite open road, direct road to Mariupol. So this would kind of really, really put a lot of pressure on the Russian soldiers, uh, the Russian army in Zaporizhia and in Donetsk. So I think that's what's going to happen here. But again, 
It's a matter of time and we never know 100% what the real game plan is going to be. It's going to be difficult. Let's not lie that, oh, the Ukrainians are just going to fight for a couple of days and then the Russians are going to collapse. You can see the amount of resources the Russians have put in um, to defend. And they've really set up huge trench lines, a lot of defense lines. So it remains to be seen how effective it's going to be. But I'm sure that the Russians are better prepared than they were when we saw this flamboyant, you know, Kharkiv counteroffensive where the Russians just literally lost all this in a matter of a week. And, you know, I think it's going to be closer to a Kherson offensive where, if you remember, back in September when Ukraine launched this, you know, uh, Kherson offensive, um, there weren't any gains in the first few weeks. And everybody was saying, oh, it's a failure. Look how the Ukrainians, they're not even able to take, you know, a couple settlements. They're having difficulties. Everybody was really criticizing it. But then you saw in a matter, like, a few weeks, two months in, and the Ukraine started getting really crazy amounts of ground. We saw that this first stretch here was, um, you know, was regained by the Ukrainians, and then they just swarmed through as the Russians just had no choice but to pull out to be able to uh, defend uh, other parts where they were having trouble in, especially in Kharkiv at that point, where the Ukrainians, you know, smartly enough, just uh, also used the advantage um, to push out the Russians in Kharkiv as well. So. It's going to be very interesting to see, but I have no doubt that the Ukrainians are going to prevail in their counteroffensive. As the Russians are unmotivated, they're bogged down, um, they're, they don't have any time to, to really rest and you know rearm themselves. And everything that Putin is doing right now is just to push, he's pulling more men out of Russia and trying to you know quickly put them to the front lines. So that's the only strategy they have. So they're inexperienced, unmotivated, um, meet at this point. So that's the situation on the front lines. Now, I only have one last uh, video to show you guys. It's very interesting. So obviously, you guys know him. It's uh, Girkin, Girkin Strelkov. So he's the Russian terrorist that, um, let's say, allowed the 2014 annexation or he accelerated the annexation of Crimea and also caused all the uh, rebellions, sort of Russian-backed rebellions in Donbass in 2014. So now he's back in Russia. And, you know, fo funny enough, even though he's a terrorist, he's strangely enough, he's been a very vocal critic of, uh, of the Russian army, the Russian leadership, and he's been very realistic in his assessments um, in terms of how this war is heading for, for Russia. And so here we can see that he made a video today with a very you know small assessment over what's going on in Russia. And so here we go. Unfortunately, the situation on the front, which the media are trying to polish, it has an extremely negative effect on the situation in the entire country, in our entire state. I am not afraid to say that we are moving toward military defeat. And guys, remember, he's one of the biggest supporters of you know Russia, Russia's colonialism and them just snatching territory. He was one of the first instigators in 2014. So, you know, seeing him criticizing and actually being realistic and saying how dire the situation is, is very telling of what's going to happen in the next few months. So here, here we go. He continues with, not even because we can make headway in any of the district capitals in Ukraine, over the winter, we were unable to push the enemy back even 10 kilometers from Donetsk and not even because we left Kherson. We rolled back from Kharkiv region, we rolled back from Kiev, but because we got in a long protracted war for which our economy was totally unprepared. And in principle, the army was not prepared for it. And the political system and personally, most of the state's officials and leaders were also unprepared for that. So now, you know, Russia is just trying to patch things together as quickly as possible to make something out of this war, out of this uh, invasion that they started. But they can't formulate anything comprehensive uh, or comprehensive strategy to to have some success. So it's undoubtedly going to happen. Russia's defeat is going to happen. It's just a matter of time. And when you have one of the most, you know, um, influential people, right, that 
started this entire conflict from the first place in 2014. Let's not forget that this war didn't start last year in 2022. It started in 2014, where Russia came in, seized illegally Crimea, and then started the proxy fights in the proxy battles in Donbass. And this set the stage for the war that we're seeing right now. And he was the instigator for it. He was backed by Putin. He was backed by Russian oligarchs. Uh, but now he sees the reality of things is that they're losing and they will lose badly once it happens. So here you go, guys. This is the video for today. Um, let me know what you think uh, about um, you know my overview um, of the potential you know movements that the Ukrainians could do uh, as part of their counteroffensive in May. And uh, if you enjoyed this video, please like the video, subscribe to my channel if you enjoy my content, and I will see you guys in the next video. Thank you so much.